thank you for that introduction from the heart. That's what it's all about. And these workshops, uh, I've done a lot of talks, uh, introductory talks and talks all around the world, but when we have a, a time space, like a whole day, better part of the morning and afternoon, you can relax and you can start to really go inward uh, towards this living experience because it's like you're giving yourself a spaciousness and we have a workshop today, uh, sometimes I'll do a, a three or four day retreat or a week long retreat, sometimes a couple weeks. Uh, when you start to feel that relaxed feeling and connected feeling, then the mask can come down, the defenses can come down. You feel comfortable, you feel you're safe, you feel there's a familiarity there and then Everybody knows that space when you allow yourself to relax, it just becomes, you become more spontaneous, more playful, and it doesn't feel like, like a, a task, like a job. It doesn't feel like you have to work at it. It's just suddenly you just find yourself flowing in the happiness. And that's what we're going to work on in this workshop uh, today. Basically, we we will be singing some songs, we'll be listening to some beautiful music. Um, we do have a, a data projector here and I was working with the gentleman. Uh, I brought uh, an Arcos that has a lot of movie clips on it. And we were trying to work the bugs out this morning, but um, he's going to come back after lunch or during while we're having lunch time and, and give it another go. But we also have a DVD projector. And so I always carry my collection of uh, DVDs of <laughs> spiritual awakening movies yeah. along with me. Uh, so that's another thing that we'll tap into as well. Because I had mentioned last night to the group that we have a movie watcher's guide to enlightenment and a lot of people really like to watch the movies in their waking up process. And we use a lot of movies. There's a lot of parables, there's a lot of wisdom, but you just have to have the eyes to see it. It's like it's all there. Some of you might have seen the movie, uh, What the Bleep Do We Know, where they talk about this. We have so much stimulus that comes at us, but really everything in the world is just a projection of our consciousness. And when we're ready to see something, we see it. And not until we're ready. So people have the same experience with the Course. They will read the book over and over and, and underline and highlight things. And they say, I didn't, I didn't see that the first time. And for me, that's the way it went with my work with the Course. I kept highlighting and underlining until pretty much I had highlighted and underlined the whole book. And I thought, well, that's okay. That's defeating the purpose here. But that's a good symbol of readiness, that in relationships, in jobs, in work with spiritual tools like the Course and other ones, when we're ready, the answer presents itself. And when we're not ready, it's like the Spirit won't force anything on us. If we're too frightened, if we're too afraid of losing something, if we believe that, that somehow we would have to sacrifice something that we, we want to cling to and we want to hold on to, then the Spirit will just wait patiently until we come to a place of choosing again and saying, okay, I, I'm not going to hold on to this anymore, I'm going to hand this over to you, and then it's just extremely light and joyful. So these workshops are very interactive, so if we talk about any topic or theme and something in you just goes, wait a minute, hold on, I don't, I don't get that, feel free to just stop and say, please, can you give me some examples, can you give me some metaphors, can we come at it from another angle maybe to help clarify that. Uh, also, these are free-flowing. I was talking to the man, the technician who was working to set up the, the video clips today. He said, I hope this doesn't affect your schedule or your agenda. And we're just calling upon the, the Holy Spirit to bring clarity and illumination to all of us. And so we let that be the guiding force as we go through the day. You know, we're not trying to adhere to a specific schedule, but we're really going for an experience and wanting to have an experience. And when we can be that open and call upon the Spirit without having outcomes and agendas in mind, then it's, it comes. It's very natural because there's no sense of 
And we're just inviting it in. We're inviting ourselves to have that experience of, of what's real and what's true, and we don't have to worry. Come on in. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Come and join us. <laughs> we just got rolling here. So you're... I'm just passing through. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Yes, we're all passing through. This is temporary. <laughs> it, it's only when we start to think that there's something permanent going on, that's when we, we get into difficulties. So. so, if you have any kind of topics, the way I do my gatherings around the world, I've been in 22 different countries, I just go where I'm invited, and people like to raise topics. And sometimes we do it in community centers like this, or we do it in, in basements and bookstores and backyards. A lot of living rooms, uh, you're sitting around on the sofa, just kicking it back and forth, and going into things in a very deep way. But to me, spirituality is really not about rituals. It does take discipline, and you may be guided to use certain rituals, but eventually the Spirit will guide you to let go of all rituals and to be completely in the moment and completely spontaneous so that there's no sense of, of having to hear some kind of uh, pattern or structure in your life. Uh, yes, you may still get up, take a shower, brush your teeth, you know, there's basic things that you do, uh, but, but you're willing to just open up every day and just tell the Spirit, use me show me, I'm here showing up with full attention to you, and now you lead the way. Uh, I'm not going to try to tell you how it has to go. So, I have a life and, and I do a lot of these gatherings where it's, they're very, very spontaneous, and you can feel free and actually are encouraged to raise any kind of topics that are very pertinent and practical in your life. If there's things that you're dealing with, and it seems to be a mystery or a struggle, please raise those issues, because whatever you raise will be a benefit to everybody. We're all going through the same awakening, and it's not like anybody has a, a harder job or an easier job or a more complicated job. It's the ego is something that needs to be exposed and released, but there's really just one ego. It just disguises itself as if it's many, or legion, but it's really just one thought system that's insane that really needs to be exposed and released. So, um, in terms of what we're also going to do today is we have some uh, songs too that Helena printed out. And we did one sing-along last night, but we have some copies of different songs. So, uh, we're incorporating a lot more music. Uh, we've always loved to, to put music meditations and very, very inspiring music as part of these gatherings. And, and I have. I mean, other than traveling and speaking and sharing with people, I've just listened to a lot of music that inspires me. And it's just been a way of music meditations of being lifted up. It kind of just goes straight to the heart. It's not something that's analytical or intellectual. And, and Helena has come all the way from Sweden, and she has prepared a number of songs. And so, these are very inspiring songs, as Les was saying. Les we had a little uh, practice session, and there were a lot of tears the other day, and it was very profound, uh, because Les was saying, as he's just said in his introduction, it's when you allow yourself to be sung through, and you just feel like you're just an instrument in the hands of the Divine, then you feel very connected and authentic during the singing. It's not like, a, it's not entertainment. It's not something that you see as something apart from you, but it's something that you can feel it's resonating within your soul. And so that's something we'll be using as well. And again, as I say, the, the video clips. Uh, how many of you met uh, Jason when we were here last year? A few people from Noosa, yeah. He, since you met him, he just, he, he was into the movie clips before, but now he's really into <laughs> the movie clips. He's a little movie producer. <laughs> so, he, uh, I ended up getting this little thing called an Arcos. It's kind of a, a fraction of the size of a laptop, but it has a 160 gigabyte hard drive, so uh, it contains a lot of movies and movie clips. 
And we used to talk about this in the good old days about uh, doing sessions where we could lead people into their mind and navigate through some of these ego blocks and beliefs by using parables like Jesus did. And the movies are like the modern day parables. Instead of, there was a man who had two sons and, and doing that, and he's in a fishing boat, Jesus is talking, the boat's rocking. You know, lo, I tell you, I am with you, even unto the end of time. And, and using these great parables, uh, we can let Hollywood uh, do the speaking. And uh, we, at our Noosa retreat, which is coming up at the end of this month, we will, I don't know how many movies we'll watch, but I've been storing up some good movies like Next uh, with Nicolas Cage, because it gets into time and escaping from the belief in time. And I brought one called Religulous, which kind of pokes fun at all the hypocrisies uh, in religions of the world. You know, our God is the way, we've got the only way, and, and the rest of the people are going to hell. This pokes fun at pretty much every single religion, everything from uh, Judaism and Christianity and Buddhism to uh, Scientology, Mormonism. I mean, it, it's quite a funny movie because he's pointing out all the hypocrisies in the beliefs. And in one sense, when you go on the spiritual journey, you do have to get past the hypocrisies. You know, Les talked about walking the walk. It really, spirituality and religion can only take you so far if you get good at talking the talk. I mean, you know, there have been some eloquent preachers and speakers, but then what happens when you're off the stage, you know? Uh, what kind of life do you live? Are you, are you consistently loving? Are you consistently giving? Do you practice what you preach? Uh, if somebody followed you around with a little camera, would they find that you were a consistent demonstration of the words? Or was it just an eloquent speech? Uh, like my friend Dorothy would say, you know, it's like going in and out of the workshop in the dining room. She, she worked at a place uh, called uh, Foundation for a Course in Miracles in Roscoe, New York, and she would watch people come, hundreds of people that would come in and sit and take notes in these workshops, uh, where Ken Wapnick would be talking about the metaphysics of the course, and as soon as they'd go in, she worked in the kitchen, as soon as they'd come through the buffet, she would hear them all going through the line, judging everything, uh, <laughs> judging people, this and this. They left their notebooks on the seat, and she was just so high, she would just laugh and she would say, it's like a revolving door, they just sit there and they, for hours, they take notes, and then they go in to have uh, some food, and they're just judging, 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 and then they go back and take more notes, and then they do this year after year, and she thought it was kind of a, like a March of the Penguins or something kind of funny looking. And uh, she was the cook, so she would prepare the food, and she'd put it out, and they would come in, and they would walk through, and then they would look at her, and they would say, too salty. And then she'd hear a few people go by, and someone who needs more salt, uh, you know, uh, too starchy, uh, you know, too, oh, this is too many calories, or, oh, I need something to really put some meat on my book. She would just hear the parade of judgments just over the food that she had prepared. And all she would do was just smile, and just, <laughs> just smile and nod, smile and nod. The cook has prepared the food with love, and now the rest is up to you. This is the practical application, you know, even when it gets down to judging food. The ego will judge anything. And it's quite critical of things. And the, the spiritual journey is learning to relax and get so comfortable and easy in the present moment that you don't need to judge. You cease to judge things. You cease to become opinionated. You cease to have to analyze and figure things out. You can allow things to unfold. You can accept the essence of what's going on without judging the behaviors and picking them apart, you know, it becomes a very relaxing state of mind. And as you carry it further more and more and more, it, life really becomes fun because, like I was sharing with the group last night, you, you seem to reach a point where you realize that you really don't have any problems, you know, in a realistic way. You, you don't have any relationship problems, you're in harmony with everything and everyone, you don't have any financial problems or problems with uh, the society. 
you know, it's the sense I said yet last night, you're not trying to get anything from anyone, so your expectations are gone, and when your expectations are gone, then everything becomes equally acceptable from that perspective, or from that state of mind. You can watch the clouds come, you can watch the rain fall, you can watch the winds come, you can watch all of the, the seasons change. It can be monsoons or bushfires, it can be economic prosperity or economic depression. It, you, it's like just watching the waves go by without any kind of attachment to them because you're not into outcomes. Uh, your peace of mind is too important to give it over to judging the outcomes. And it doesn't really matter how you were raised, you know, what you were raised to prefer, or to say this is, this is right and good and true and other people should be like this. You, you start to realize, no, my peace of mind is more important than all of that conditioning. And I'm willing to surrender to the Spirit and let my past conditioning be washed away to the point where if I still have some ego preferences, then Holy Spirit, I give you the ego preferences. Uh, if I still have a whim for something, the Spirit doesn't want you to have a sense of sacrifice or feel like something's being taken away from you. You will get a number of whims that come in that is kind of like symbols of how much the Spirit loves you. You know, that nothing's, the tablecloth's not getting pulled out, nothing's getting ripped away, it's just a gentle retranslation of your entire world into a very soft perspective, like pastel colors, you know, everything gets very soft and, and gentle. And you, you might say you give up the fight, uh, you give up the struggle. And so that's why I do these gatherings, is, is from this perspective, uh, everything does become quite humorous, and you can laugh at many, many things that come along, but there's not that sense of seriousness, you know, feeling like you've got, you've got to change somebody or something. And, and also the analysis falls away, and the fix it, you know, got to fix this, fix that. You start to be convinced more and more that, that the problems that you thought were there aren't really there. It's just a figment of, of imagination. So, I think, um, Maybe just to, oh, we've got a question back here. Can I have five minutes of our time? I want a, I'm a salesman, I want to sell this book. <laughs> sell the shack? Yeah. Maybe during lunchtime. I won't what? Be, I, I'm coming and going. You're just here to sell the book and then go on. <laughs> five minutes? Well, actually, that's one of the things. I, I don't sell anything. I've got nothing, <laughs> nothing to sell. But, but actually, I think what we'll do is, we're just kind of working into our day. We just got started, actually, right before you came, and we're just easing into the beginning of things. So, um, My feeling, too, was uh, maybe, Helena, would you like to come and uh, sing a song for us to kind of open up our, our day? And I could put the mic up here for you. Do you need the mic stand?
for this uh, really month and a half tour, a month in Australia, then up to Fiji and then Hawaii. Um, Raj wrote an email to Jenny, we met Jenny last year, and she's coordinating the tour, and, and Raj says, hmm, don't know the economic crisis has hit Australia, and the, it doesn't look like there's as many people registering for, for NUSA, and, and was saying, well, you know, we may not uh, be able to uh, afford uh, to pay for Helena's uh, air flight, and it was like, well, it's all set in motion. And we're coming, she's coming from Copenhagen, <laughs> and I'm coming from San Francisco. And I, I, Jenny said, well, what should I say? I said, right, no worries, mate. <laughs> uh, that you'll understand uh, how this works. Uh, you know, you really do, you get so into the flow. I've been living off of Divine, Divine Providence since 1991. So that was the last time I had a a job with a paycheck, and uh, it works great, you know, it's like the spirit handles everything, everything is always covered. You don't, you don't have to look at the little things and do all the juggling of the numbers, you know, it always works out. And it's great, that's why I always say I work for the greatest boss that can do, you work for the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's really, Holy Spirit's not into numbers, you know, it's never, uh, do we have enough money to do this, the Holy Spirit's you know, I'm using the symbols, I've got all the use of the symbols, and you can relax, like the song says, you can relax now, you don't have to worry about the, the details. At first, when I started doing this work, it, it was a little bit upside down, I mean, I spent my whole life being conditioned about how to focus on the details, you know, make sure that, that you cross your T's, you dot your I's, make sure that you have the bottom line covered first, uh, and this is more uh, wing it for Jesus and uh, have a good time. And uh, some of you remember those songs from the 60s, you know, Jesus is just all right with me. You know, I, I did go through phases after Christianity where I, I had issues with Christianity and then I realized that, that it was just ego projections that I projected onto Jesus. Uh, that was the only problem. Uh, there's no problem at all with Jesus or with the message of love and forgiveness. It was just that I had these ideas that were still in my mind that I had projected onto Jesus. And so I just, at one point, I said, oh, I'm sorry, I, I won't do that anymore. I really want to be happy and free. Now I get comments from a lot of people that are more saying, well, you, you live like Jesus. Some people say, well, you're the closest person that I've met to Jesus in this day and age. But I, I really do live like Jesus and the Apostles. I, I just do things on a donation basis. Uh, if people show up and they say, can I come? I say, come on, come all along. If, uh, they say, I, I would like this resource or whatever. I say, well, we load it on the internet, it's for free. And if you, if you really need it in hard copy, and if it's really important, then take it. Uh, it'll, it all works out. Uh, it's not about uh, turning any, anyone away. Jesus dictated a uh, psychotherapy pamphlet, and in it he said, one general rule should always be observed, no one should ever be turned away who cannot afford to pay. Uh, he would basically say that if you try to charge money for spirituality, it's like the unhealed healer. Uh, you know, the, the healer needs healing if there's that, that sense of, of demand or sense of reciprocity that's involved with it. Now, when you get into this glee and joy, and, you, and it becomes your lifestyle, your way of life, uh, at first it can, it's a bit shocking to the ego, but then again, you know, the ego is the thing that's getting undone. It's like, you know, buddy, you can take a hike. Uh, my mind's too important to let something like a false belief, like a little leech, hang on there and try to use the power of my mind. So I just really relaxed into this journey. Um, I started working with the Course in 1986, and some of you know the story, I just read it for eight hours a day and immersed myself in, in it for probably about two and a half years until I could hear Jesus speaking to me in very conversational tones, and then my life got very easy. Go here, go there, go back, you forgot your keys, you know, turn left, turn right, stop off. Back in those days, uh, didn't have cell phones and laptops. Uh, it was basically, you know, you take along, I'm not sure if it was, if 
pay phones, it was 10 cents or 25 cents for a call. But basically I would go into an area, I would have a little list of numbers of Course in Miracles groups uh, provided by the Miracles Distribution Center. I'm out there on the road in my little three-cylinder car. Back then, the price of gas was like a dollar ten a gallon. I could go for 40 miles. Well, I mean, I could go all over the United States. And, you know how big Australia is. Imagine going all over uh, Australia. Very much, very simply, uh, people welcoming me into their homes. Stay with us. Stay, stay another night. Uh, people welcoming into their churches and basements and bookstores, backyards. Gatherings on beaches, uh, in forests, um, in teepees, uh, any, uh, on a houseboat. Uh, you know, it was like anything will work. Uh, it's just sharing the joy and coming together in that way. And so I learned to just trust and really know that for the first five years of my travels from 1991 to 1996, I wouldn't know from night to night where the body of David would be laying the head down. Uh, I didn't have my hotel room or my motel room booked. I would go to a course group, and I'd have some ego thoughts sometimes, like, oh, where, where are you going to sleep tonight? And then I'd go to a course group, and like three different people would invite me home. So it wasn't a problem of finding a place to sleep, it was where am I supposed to sleep? <laughs> uh, which one of these, and the Holy Spirit said, go, go with this one. Uh, no income, uh, no credit cards. Pretty scary stuff to the ego, but, but what I discovered was, Jesus said, you know, no, you will never charge any money for anything you do. It's just not the way it's going to work. I will provide for you. I will use the symbols. I will go before you, and everything that you seem to need will be provided. If that sounds kind of extraterrestrial. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> money doesn't grow on trees, and what do you, happens if you get to a point where, you know, you don't know what to do? My first trip out, I mean, this little gold uh, Chevrolet uh, sp uh, sp Sprint, it was, we would go around and basically uh, I would just stop wherever I was guided, go in, and my, I think it was like the third or fourth night out, I met a salesman who, who had a bunch of, he, he had a big box, about this big, of uh, those individually packaged boxes of cereal. Uh, you know, that you have those little individual ones. Mm -hmm. And if you're, it's your first trip out and you've got thoughts of what, what if I don't have something to eat? Uh, and you've got this little car and in the back is this big box. Uh, the woman that has guided to go with me, she said, you can't possibly eat cereal every day. I actually enjoyed it. It was like having an individual potato chip uh, thing, you know, except it was like whole wheat or cornflakes or basically grains. St. Francis, Mother Teresa would have said, oh, you're living the high life. Uh, individually fresh grains every day, you know. Uh, and already I was kind of loose, you know, like, well, I, I'm not too concerned about being fancy here. I just want to go shine my light and share my love. And so I had these miracle distribution lists of all these states, of all these Course in Miracles groups. The United States, it's a big place, and uh, sometimes I would get invited in, I would be guided by the Spirit to go to a church, and I would look at the list, and I would say, okay, it's 10 minutes till 12. Ah, the course group ends at 12. Uh, it's only an hour meeting, it goes from 11 to 12, and the Holy Spirit would say, go to the meeting. I said, go to the meeting, walk in at the last 10 minutes of a church I've never been to, a course meeting I've never been to. So that's what happened to me uh, when I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I walked in, uh, they were all having a big discussion about sexuality, uh, and they were all fired up, and it was a really a, a hot discussion and everything, and I just kind of sat there. And then afterwards, they were so heated that they didn't even see me come in, and then they all went, oh my god, uh, when did you get here? And I said, I just walked in, and they said, well, that's definitely we're talking about it's not like, that's not a regular course meeting. <laughs> this, is, this is not really how it looks. And they said, uh, but we are having lunch together. And this man said, come on, would you come with us to lunch? We go out for lunch every Sunday after the course meeting. I'll, come on, I'm buying, come along. So I go there. 
then come on to my condominium. Uh, I insist, uh, come and do you play any sports as well? I play tennis and as well. Here's my tennis racket and here's the balls. You never met the man. This is typical, of course, meetings. You go in there, you've never met the person, and they're, they're, you're staying at their condominium. They're giving you tennis balls, tennis rackets. The pool's down here, and the condo, condo's here. Here's the keys. Uh, the hot tub's there, and blah, blah, blah. I gotta go. Uh, I got some errors to run this afternoon. Make yourself at home. Anything's in the fridge. And this is from going to the last 10 minutes of the Course of Miracles meeting. Nobody prepares you for that, you know. You know, your mama never told you that. Your daddy never told you that life works that way. Well, it, it, he basically said, uh, you seem to, to have a lot of wisdom about this Course in Miracles, so let me get on the horn. I'm gonna, I got a houseboat. I'm going to call the, my friends up. Let's have a Course in Miracles meeting on my houseboat tonight. Let's do a potluck. I'll get the watermelon. I, I got to go do some errands, but when I come back, I'm going to get on the horn. End up having a, a gathering on a houseboat in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with the bright moon shining and shimmering water, something like out of a picture, uh, spitting the seeds of watermelon off the side of the boat. And they all wanted to know about sexuality. They just mm -hmm. wanted to know what Jesus had to say about sexuality. They really wanted to do a continue on their heated debate in a much more relaxed setting, instead of the church. <laughs> it can get kind of risky in a church to, to go into this kind of thing. So, on the houseboat, no problem. They were, you know, 11 o'clock at night with the moon shimmering, that's the time to go in and explore sexuality. You know. And then, they pulled in about midnight, this is Sunday night, and they all looked at me and said, well, we got to go to work tomorrow. But this guy who invited me to his condo, he said, here, you can stay on the houseboat as long as you want. You know, live on it if you want. Uh, make yourself at home and just hand it over the houseboat. And I'm just like, whoa, this is amazing. Now that was the thir like the third night out. The second night out, I was at a campground where this blind man sang and all this wisdom and joy. It was like hopping into a campground with Stevie Wonder. Uh, you know, it was so inspired. And that was the second night out. The first night out, these are my first three nights out on the road with the Holy Spirit, you know, trusting in divine providence. The first night out was, uh, I was at a church, and they said, come on, come on, there's a Course in Miracles meeting here, and we want you to speak at the meeting. So I did. And they really liked it. They liked everything that I was sharing, and they said, can you stay for the second meeting? And I thought, that's strange. Why would you have like two course meetings back to back? Why not just combine them into one long meeting? They said, no, no, it's the Urantia book. It's a different teaching. It's the life and teachings of Jesus. Uh, kind of if, if you could see his full life instead of just the little clips in the Bible, you know, where he's oh, born of a virgin and then boom, he's 12 years old in the temple. Don't you know I have to be about my father's business? And boom, suddenly he's a, he's a grown man and he's calling apostles, and you know, it's, there's a lot of missing gaps there. So this big book is handed to me, called the Arantia Book, and the last section is the life and teachings of Jesus in great detail. What did Jesus do through puberty? How did he handle the dating scene? Uh, how did he handle a Jewish mother? Uh, you know, uh, his father, Joseph, died when he was 15. How did he deal with that when you're 15 years old and your dad dies? Uh, and then he had this kind of destiny in his life, that he was to, to demonstrate the will of, of God on Earth, which is Urantia, that's the name of Earth in the overall galactic system. And very fascinating for me, it's one thing to study the Course, but until you really get tuned into that guidance, most of the time you have questions like, how do I practically apply this teaching in my day-to-day -day living? You know, did Jesus and the Apostles have a bank account? Uh, yeah, they did. Uh, how do they handle lodging? If you're on the go and you got, I mean, it's one thing for, for Les and Tina to go travel around and, you know, you book your hotels and you stop off wherever the flights go and this and that. Imagine 13 guys moving around. <laughs> it's not like you can go, did you have a spare couch? Uh, or well, how many you got in your party? There's 13 of us. Uh, and so you got this group of not really 
you know, they got sandals, they've been hiking all day, they're hot and sweaty, and they probably got dirt and sand and stuff in their toenails and, and so forth, and probably pretty long toenails and everything, and then you got, well, you're going to invite them on your couch or whatever. You know, there was lodging, there was logistics. As the ministry went on, there was ushers, they needed crowd control, uh, you know, just like at a stadium. Otherwise, it turns into like that Who concert where people get trampled. You know, you've got to have, look at all the logistics involved in a public ministry. You know, Jesus was not like the mystic that's just sitting in the cave going, Om. He was out and about demonstrating unconditional love on a planet where love was completely covered over and hidden. It was more like a, a meteor of light hitting the ocean and sending a giant tsunami of shock waves to the ego. And the ego could not handle this message. It was too loving. It was too loving for it to handle. In fact, the ego is still reverberating. We still have shock waves uh, going on 2,000 years after Jesus was here because his message really undid this whole world. Uh, it, the ego couldn't handle it. The crucifixion, you might say that, that the ego can't stand innocence. So anything that's perceived as perfectly innocent must be killed. Uh, the ego can't stand joy and happiness. You know, anything that's too joyful and happy must be killed, eradicated. Uh, the ego can't stand friendliness. Uh, it's got to have some viciousness to greet friendliness, you know, to... I can't listen to this anymore. next time. Okay. Thank you for passing by. We love you. Okay. <laughs> we love you. Thank you. Thanks for coming last night, too. So, so now, this is the joy for all of us, is now we get to practically live the teachings of Jesus uh, and put them into practice. So, I remember, uh, as I started working with the Course, I think the last time that I had a doctor's appointment was in about 19... 84, I think, uh, I was going into graduate school after about seven or eight years in undergrad, and they said, you cannot get accepted into graduate school unless you have a physical examination. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to go to one of those people with the white coats and, and everything. This will be strange. And I remember going in there, and I remember having this talk with the doctor. I said, let's, let's kind of get this clear right away. I said, I really am seeing that, that all illness is mental illness, uh, that everything that seems to be illness is just a, a crazy thought in the mind, and I really practice not holding on to any of those thoughts. So you, but I need the piece of paper signed uh, that says that I'm in good physical health and everything, and the doctor said, I, I get what you're talking about. He said, we'll just go, we'll make this real quick, and uh, Let's do this. Uh, stick your tongue out. Uh, it's a little whack on the knee here, and do all the things that briefly, you know, the things that they're supposed to do, and then check, 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 sign it. So that was the end of of David and the medical model, uh, you know, uh, back in 1984. Um, actually, it was sometime. I think it might have been in uh, in the 2000s or whatever, where the spirit did guide me to go in for a teeth cleaning, but I had not been to the dentist for the same length of time that I hadn't been to the daughter, uh, to the doctor. So it was kind of a spectacle in this dental office out in California, uh, because they make you fill out all these forms before you go in there, including your, your dental work and the last time you were there. And the, when I put something like 1984 uh, down on there, and this was up in the 2000s, it created a stir among the dental technicians. And they, the dental technicians basically handled the whole procedure, but they had to get the dentist because they say, well, we got a real strange bird in here. And then he's, he's like, he said, maybe it was a shock to their profession. You know, it's like, this, this is not exactly the way you're supposed to do this, sir. Uh, but they, I was very peaceful and happy and joyful, and they said, what do you do? And I, the more that I spoke for my brief time in the dental office, it, it, they got very excited. They had like four or five technicians coming in and the dentist got called out of some procedure, and they said, oh, we had another guy in here who writes these books. He's a Christian minister. He's real famous, and we could feel the same vibe or something. There's something going on. So it, 
the more you become simple, the more you live in the present moment, the more you see the unreality of the world, it kind of, it seems to create a bit of a stir in the world, because it's just not normal. Uh, you're, you're far beyond normal. Uh, you're like off the chart. You're not really not off the chart.